this, I wasn't sure what, what the layout was going to be. I thought that uh, you would have had to come up with it. I'm sorry, you were going to ask? So, I guess I'll kind of stand up at a quarter to, and then at the 10 to, uh, well, right. maybe a few minutes, three minutes before then. I'll just kind of get. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll plan to, um, um, a couple of slides I'm going to speak very quickly. Um, but I, I think I'm going to go through it. I won't take long. So Testing one, two. Testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. L little bit better? Yeah, Okay. I'm not used to having somebody else drive my, my slides. It's, it's going to be great, but it, it, it's going to be weird because I'm usually, when I'm done, that's when I hit the button. I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at following along. Uh, all, right, all right, all right, perfect.
Okay. Well, that makes a difference. Wow. <laughs> Sorry about that, and thank you for speaking up. Um, let's see. So it, when it comes time to questions for questions and answers, I just ask that you use, well, I'll bring a mic to you, but that way people online can hear, this is, session is being recorded, and then your question can be heard by when people listen later. So I just wanna give a big thanks to Alex Johnson, our AV person, he's awesome. And yes, yay. <laughs> and then our guest this morning is Todd Burlett. He's a delegate with the International Dark Sky Association, also known as the IDA. And he's, which that organization's been the world's leading authority on light pollution since 1988. And he's the president of the Starry Skies North, the that's the Minnesota and Mid-Continent chapter of the International Dark Sky Association. So we're here to learn all about light pollution. And anyway, I think it's, it's really gonna be fascinating. Um, and welcome, Todd. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, that great introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Todd Burlett. Uh, let's go ahead. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is light pollution, of course, but we're going to break it down into three pieces. First of all, what is it? What do we mean when we say light pollution? We're going to talk about what some of the key types of light pollution are, why we should all matter about light pollution, and there's about a half a dozen really good reasons I, I think light pollution uh, should be something we want to think more about. And then we're going to talk a little bit about some solutions what we can all do that are, are low cost, no cost solutions uh, to help mitigate light pollution. So next slide, please. Okay, uh, this one we already talked about. Uh, why should you care? We're gonna talk a little bit about human health and wellness, culture, ecosystems. We're gonna talk a little bit about all of the damages to ecosystems, uh, climate change, your wallet, and, uh, and then a little bit on environmental justice and then both as individuals and businesses and community members, what we can do about light pollution. Next slide. Okay, we've already talked a little bit about this. I am Todd Burlett. I, uh, I started off uh, being interested in astronomy when I was about yay big. My father showed me Mars one night. I must have been six or seven. And I was blown away by the fact that you could go out from the surface of planet Earth and look up and there was this red dot in the sky and that was another planet. And that was, was just mind boggling to me. I was hooked. Every year for Christmas after that, I asked for a telescope for, for Christmas. And I must have been about 10 or 11. Mom and Dad finally got me the Sears catalog special Christmas telescope. It was made out of cardboard and it had plastic lenses and little flimsy aluminum legs, but I had a telescope. And I could take that out to the front yard. And my problem with light pollution at that time consisted of the street light in the front yard. So I could solve light pollution by picking up my telescope, walking it into the backyard, problem solved. I'm, I'm away from that light. Light pollution now is, is a rather bigger problem and, and we'll talk about that. Uh, I am a member of the International Dark Sky Association, or I IDA. I'm a delegate, which just means I've hung around long enough that they finally had to give me a title. So uh, uh, the IDA has uh, been around since about 1988. They started by uh, a couple of astronomers trying to protect the telescopes up on some of the mountains from all of the light pollution from nearby cities like Tucson. So they're coming up next year will be their 35th anniversary. And one of the things that they've launched is, uh, oh, I should start this, otherwise I'm gonna definitely run out of time. Yes. Uh, uh, they, they started what are called International Dark Sky Places. So just as we have national parks, state parks, IDSPs, International Dark Sky Places, are places that have been set aside as dark sky reserves. And we'll talk about uh, some of those that, that we have right here in Minnesota. There are now 200 around the world, all six continents. Uh, the only exception being Antarctica, no surprise there. Uh, within Minnesota, more locally, uh, our local state chapter is called Starry Skies North. They wanted us to be called Dark Skies. And I thought, no one wants to camp out under dark skies. Everyone wants to be under starry skies, right? So, so we, we insisted that our name be Starry Skies North. And so we work uh, within the state 
And then also uh, within the broader, what we call the mid-continent region. So the six states, including Minnesota in the upper Midwest here, as well as the Canadian provinces off to the north. Okay, so a couple definitions real quick. Um, artificial light at night, that's a mouthful, we just call it Allen, artificial light at night. So you hear that term. Allen is like a tool, light is like a tool, we use it for good purposes and it can do a lot of great things for us. It keeps us safe on the roads, lets us go watch the kids and grandkids at, at the stadiums. Uh, so Allen is, is not a bad thing in and of itself. Where Allen turns into light pollution is when it's used excessively. Those lights that are on too long at night, they're shining into your eyes. So there's a distinction between light that serves a purpose and, and everyone values and light pollution that's too much of a good thing. Allen, uh, yeah, that, that's fine, okay. Allen's been growing at twice the rate of population growth since 1950. Allen really didn't become a problem, light pollution didn't become a problem really until about the mid-1940s, right after the rural electrification. And then it really didn't take off uh, until after World War II. Up until that point, a lot of farmers out in, in rural areas still just had their gas lights, their, their kerosene lights, and it wasn't until either side of World War II that we really started to light up uh, rural areas. Uh, at this point, 99% of Americans and Europeans live under a light polluted sky. Let that sink in, 99% of us, you, me, everyone in the metro area, most people in Minnesota. Okay, next one. Okay, uh, real quick, fancy term, color temperature. You've maybe all become familiar with this a, a little bit. You know, everyone here looks to be about, about my age, give, give or take. We all grew up when all you had to do to figure out what light bulb you wanted to buy was to go out and figure out how many watts I wanted. Did I want the 45 watt bulb? Did I want the 60? If I wanted it really bright, I wanted a 100 watt bulb. And no one talked about color temperature because that wasn't a, a thing. Now we've got LEDs and we can pick whatever color we want. And so you can go out and you can buy something that's at about 8,000 color temperature. Think of color temperature, uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. When you stick an iron in a fire and it gets red, that's red hot. That, that's down here at, at, at this end, so about 1,000 degrees or so. If you left that in there and it got hotter and hotter, it would get yellow hot and finally blue hot. That's what we mean by color temperature. The surface of the sun's about 5,600 degrees. Uh, the sky looks bluer than that because the, the orange and, and red light is what comes straight through the sky. The blue light from the sun is what gets scattered into the sky and, and gives us our blue sky. So the sky actually looks bluer than the surface of the sun. And then down here, 3,000 degrees Kelvin is actually the limit from the American Medical Association. We'll talk a little bit about that later. The American Medical Association in 2016 came out and identified light pollution, especially these, these bluer colors, as being unsafe, unhealthy for, for people. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So as you're thinking, as we go through the presentation about where you wanna be, especially with those, those lights that you're gonna put outside, we're gonna talk about these warmer white colors, these nice 2700 degree, 2800 degree uh, color temperatures. Next slide. Okay, so what do we mean by light pollution? Really, it, it can be broken down into four different types of light pollution. There's, there's the glare and you think about this as those headlights at, at night, those high beams shining into your eyes or that neighbor that's got those horrible security lights that shine right into your eyes. Glare is light coming right in, into your eyes. Light trespasses is probably the, the second most common. Again, it's, it's light from somebody else. It's maybe a street light, it's maybe from a, a business, maybe from an industrial area, but it's that light that you don't control that's shining into your bedroom, shining in, into your yard. Uh, so we see a lot, of, a lot of this, and here's a great example. Sky glow, this is kind of the, the accumulation of all of the light pollution uh, in your surrounding area. So for example, uh, if I wanna get out of the light pollution of Minneapolis, I've got to get in my car and I've got to drive 100 miles. So there, there's a light dome around Minneapolis and, and many big cities. Uh, people report that in Death Valley, California, 150 miles from Las Vegas, 
you can see that dome of light pollution coming from Las Vegas 150 miles away. Uh, and then clutter, and, and this is something, as, as I get older, this is getting to be more and more of an issue where you've got so many lights vying for your attention as, as you're driving down that, that road or driving down that, that street, your, your brain is trying to figure out which light do I care about? Is this the light that's lighting up the pedestrian? Is this the light that's a car coming right at me? So it's visual clutter. That just makes it hard to figure out what to look at, what to pay attention to. Next slide. Okay, so I talked about light pollution growing at twice the rate of population growth since 1950. This, this was me as, as the 10-year-old kid in, in 1970. Uh, so this is Minneapolis here. You can see most of Minnesota, northern Minnesota. It was pretty dark. This is where we are today. This was a projection from 1997 data looking forward to 2025. And you can see the eastern half of the United States is completely light polluted. Next slide. So zooming in a little bit more. Uh, so here's, here's the situation. In the eastern half of the United States, so east of the Mississippi River, there's one spot in northern Maine that is naturally dark. There's one little spot right in the tip of the Keweenaw Peninsula up there by Copper Harbor, and there's northern Minnesota, and those are the only places where that 1% of, of us live that we can get out of, of light pollution. Next slide. Zooming in a little bit more on, on Minnesota it, itself, uh, we've got a couple of places here that we are actually extremely proud of, should be very proud of as, as residents of, of Minnesota. We've got just across the border up here, Quetico Provincial Park, one of those IDSPs, International Dark Sky Places. Voyagers National Park, an IDSP. Boundary Waters Canoe Area, not only is it an IDSP, it's an international dark sky sanctuary, which is a term that is restricted to the most pristine, darkest places on the planet. And we've got this in northern Minnesota up by Ely. It is the world's largest international dark sky sanctuary, and it's here in our backyard. So uh, certainly a, a natural resource that we want to protect, preserve, and take advantage of. Next slide. Okay, so, so that's light pollution. That's, that's kind of grounding us on what the current state of light pollution is. Uh, next slide. Why, why should we care? Uh, we're going to talk very briefly about six different reasons. Uh, energy waste, the value of natural darkness, uh, wildlife and, and ecosystems, human health and wellness, a lot of stuff going on there, environmental justice, a lot of stuff going on there. And then cultural heritage, all of those are impacted in a negative way by light pollution. So we'll go through those very briefly. Uh, starting with human health and, and wellness. Everyone know what melatonin is? Have, have you heard about melatonin? And, and turning off those, those blue screens at, at night? All life on, on Earth evolved under a natural day-night cycle. You can go back to the earliest organisms that predate the, the great oxidation event five to six hundred million years ago. Blue-green algae, cyanobacteria, developed a circadian clock because they had to survive in a day-night cycle. So during the day, they had the sunlight, they were fixing carbon dioxide out of the air, turning that into sugars. At night, they would take those sugars, consume them, give off oxygen. It's actually what gave us our oxygen environment. But even at, at the dawn of, of, of life on Earth, they had to figure out how to manage to get through the night. And so that day-night cycle, that uh, melatonin and that circadian rhythm that it drives have been preserved across species uh, for half a billion years. So it, it's not just in, in humans, it's in fish, it's in birds, it's in salamanders. Uh, just about everything on, on the planet uses melatonin or something very similar to melatonin to drive that day-night cycle. Okay, next slide. So why do we care about melatonin? Uh, certainly it, it helps us sleep at night. You can go out to CVS or Walgreens and, and buy a melatonin tablet and it helps you sleep at night. 
but it's, it's not just about sleep, it's about what the body is, is doing while you're sleeping. I think of it as the cleaning crew that, that comes out. Uh, you know, if, if our bodies were office buildings, what's going on at night is the cleaning crew is, is coming out and it's cleaning up all of the cellular junk that's accumulated during the day. So whether that's the lactic acid, it's the DNA damage that, that occurred, that oxidative stress during the day. And we're preparing, the, the whole body is getting ready for the, the next day. Uh, so our body behaves very differently at night while we're sleeping than it does during the day. Uh, those of us on, on statins, we've all been told to take that statin at night, right? Well, this is why. It's because what the liver is doing at night is different than what it's doing during the day. So there's a biological reason, and it is because our bodies are going through this day-night circadian rhythm. So what happens if we don't get that restorative sleep? It's, uh, it's, it's really a, a witch's brew of, of health impacts. Uh, so breast and prostate cancer are, are probably the two most well-known, uh, but lung, pancreatic, colorectal, bladder cancers, uh, have all been associated with exposure to uh, artificial light at night. Obesity, cardio cardiovascular disease, you can read some of those others. Uh, some of the ones that, that are, are a little bit newer, they, they still need to do more research, but right now the research supports it. Even things such as multiple sclerosis and uh, babies ending up on the autism spectrum have been associated with exposure, prenatal exposure to uh, those brighter blue lights at, at night. And then, so those are the health impacts, the wellness impacts, uh, anxiety, bipolar depression, uh, and then not surprisingly, excessive sleepiness, and then impaired daytime function because you're just tired that, that next day. So as I mentioned, because of all of this, in 2014, uh, the AMA came out and declared light pollution as a risk to human health. No one paid any attention, so they relaunched that, that proclamation in 2016, really recommending, as, as I mentioned earlier, avoiding those blue intense lights at night. Blue intense lights are, are great to wake you up in the morning, not so much at, at night. Okay, so human health and wellness. Moving on to ecosystem impact. So as, as I mentioned, Circadian rhythms exist in, in creatures all across the, the ecosystem. It's not just in humans, it's in phytoplankton and zooplankton that sit down at the bottom of our ecosystem, the bottom of the food chain. Their behavior is, is disrupted. The zooplankton are these little animals that at night they come up to the top and they eat the phytoplankton, they eat the algae, and then when the sun comes out, they go down to the bottom of the lakes and rivers and, and they hang out down there. Under light pollution, they don't come up to eat the phytoplankton, so there's fewer zooplankton, and then zooplankton then are normally eaten by everything else up the food chain, so uh, the salamanders, the fish, what have you. With fewer zooplankton, you've now got uh, disruption of, of the entire food web, uh, starting from the bottom on up. We create novel predator-prey relations, so we've got this excess light at night, and creatures that normally would go to bed at, at, uh, in the evening when it gets dark are now staying active because they think it's daytime. And meanwhile, the nighttime creatures, the ones that don't mind a little bit of light, are coming out and going, hey, what's all these butterfly things? These, these are really tasty. And, and so you, you create novel predator-prey relationships, and then the existing predator-prey relationships get unbalanced. The, the great example is, is owls. Owls are phenomenal hunters that can hunt in little or, or no light, and of course they're going after the rodents. And you think about the, the size of the eye of an owl versus the size of an eye of a rodent. They have gone through uh, basically a, a balance of predator-prey. The rodents can hide under leaf litter and, and what have you. Uh, and then the, the owls maintain that balance by having amazing vision at, at night. Now you add some light, now the rodents can see the owls coming, they can get out of the way, the owls are less successful, so you've got more rodents and, and fewer owls. Animals, uh, we, so that's ecosystems in general. Uh, more broadly, everything that animals do as part of the, their life gets disrupted. So it's, it's migration, when they're moving, how they're getting from point A to point B, 
Uh, you may be familiar with the Audubon Society's Lights Out program that encourages building owners to turn off their lights while the birds are migrating uh, back and forth. And that's been somewhat successful uh, at preventing bird strikes. But what also happens is, is even the birds that aren't hitting these buildings are getting entrapped in this light area. They fly into an, a, an urban area and they get all of this light around them and, and they get uh, entrapped in there and they'll fly around and around and around the urban area, not being willing to fly back out in, into the darkness. And so rather than getting from here to the boundary waters or wherever they're going, they spend their night going around and around and around the metro area, burning all that energy, wasting that, that time, and then reducing the chances that they're going to have the energy that they need to get where they're going. Uh, courtship, mating, fertility, all negatively impacted, uh, again, because of these hormone dis disruptions. Uh, and, and then plants, shifts in phenology, so when things are, are happening. So the plants are blooming earlier, maybe before the animals that are going to eat those plants have, have even shown up. So now you, you've pulled apart these, these food webs where the, the birds haven't shown up yet, for example, but the berries have already come and gone. And so these birds, the ones that didn't run into the buildings, and, and didn't exhaust themselves flying around and around the city, now don't have the food that they expect to find. Next slide. Same, same thing's going on with fish and amphibians. Uh, again, when, when I started this, it never occurred to me that fish have melatonin, uh, but they, they do and they behave at least in a biological sense, much like humans do. They're, they're doing things at night such as, as, as resting. Uh, lack of that melatonin, uh, melatonin is, is, think of it as, as a master switch. It's not just melatonin that's moving through the body that, that is having all of these impacts. It's that melatonin is acting as a master switch on a lot of other hormones and the endocrine system within the body. And one of these that, that it impacts is the reproductive hormones in fish. So by exposing fish to uh, artificial light at, at night, but not only are you making it more difficult for them to sleep, you're actually inhibiting their reproductive success. Uh, and then uh, this was a, a study in particular about largemouth bass, so if any of you are, are into fishing, this is actually going, going to matter to you, because what happens is those largemouth bass will stay awake all night in, in a state of fear. They're operating in a fight or flight mode all night rather than resting, restoring. They're up all night burning those, those calories because they think they're about to be attacked. So they're, they're uh, burning through all of their resources and they've got less reproductive success, less likely to make it through that, that winter. Some of the things are happening with, with frogs and, and toads. So it's, it's really a, across the, the board with animals. Next slide. We talked a little bit about the Audubon Society's uh, Lights Out at, at Night program. There's something very similar that, that uh, Canada has. They, they call it the FLAP program, the Fatal Light Awareness Program. This is from uh, one night in Toronto. You maybe can't see it. Uh, these are all uh, birds, uh, mostly songbirds, that died while running into the buildings in, in Toronto in one night. So there are volunteers that go out, collect these in, in the morning. Uh, they take a picture once a year of, of one night's worth of, of birds. Uh, since 1970, we've lost 30% of our songbirds in this country. Some of it's due to impacts, but some of it's also due to the light pollution issues that, that I just discussed. Disorientation and entrapment we talked about. Stopover habitat avoidance. Uh, and then nesting habitat. So once they get to where they're going, they're gonna need to find a, a, a nest. They're gonna pick out a nesting site. And they're gonna pick that site based on food, water, safety. They're gonna to wanna to pick some place that it's gonna be a good place to raise their, their chicks. But if that place is also light polluted, they're going to move down the road to some place that's maybe less optimal for them has less access to food, less access to water, but it's darker. So now they're nesting in a suboptimal place, which is going to make it harder for them to raise their, their chicks. Bats are kind of interesting. Uh, there are kind of, you can lump bats in, into two clumps. 
the bats that don't mind light and the bats that do mind light. The bats that don't mind light are feasting because we've got all of these rural lights out there that are attracting all of these insects. And so those bats are over there just chowing down. Meanwhile, the other bats that don't like lights are sitting back in the dark areas looking around, where'd my food go? So they're suffering in the short term. In the long term, even the bats that don't mind light are gonna be suffering because they are currently overeating the insects because the, the chow bag is out, right? So they're eating through the supply of, of insects, uh, which is possibly contributing to the, the great decline in the insects that we've seen in recent decades. So uh, long term, it's bad for all types of bats. Next slide. Okay, that, that's enough on, on animals. Lots of, the, lots of the, the night sky is, is really an important issue, and it's, of course, what brought me to the issue of, of light pollution. Um, but if you think about it, astronomy is, is really uh, at the root of, of human culture. Some people claim that it is the world's first science, and it's uh, certainly where we put a lot of our cultural elements, and we'll talk about that briefly uh, in, in a slide or two. But, but here's something that, that I think is, is really important. The night sky is part of our ecosystem. If you go down to uh, the Black Canyon of, of the Gunnison National, National Park, I think it's a park, not a monument, they've got wonderful posters there and they say half of the park is at night. And that's so true. We all go to these places and enjoy them during the day and then at night we all run back to our hotel rooms or our, our, our tents and, and that's the end of it. But half of what's going on in, in any park is what's going on at night. And we all have a basic human right to go out and enjoy the, the night, enjoy the, the stars, and enjoy the crickets, what, what have you. And of course, um, I always say you, you can't study what you can't see. So, you know, of course, we, we've got the, this great telescope that just went up, the James Webb Space Telescope. It's way out in space. We, it doesn't care about light pollution. But for all of us down on Earth trying to study astronomy and, and understand the, the universe that surrounds us, if you can't see it, you can't study it. It's a great uh, quote from well, Henry uh, David Thoreau that, that I just love. Uh, if you can't read it, I'll, I'll read it. I should not like to think that some demigod had come before me and picked out some of the best of the stars. I wish to know an entire heaven and an entire Earth. And he wrote that in 1856 before light pollution was even a thing. But uh, let, let's go on. Next slide. Loss of the night sky, so we're obviously living under light pollution. Just how bad is it? There's a scale that we like to use, it's called the Bortle scale. It, it's a nine point scale with one being pristine natural darkness. So the boundary waters, the core of the boundary waters is Bortle one. Downtown Minneapolis is at the far extreme of that. We're Bortle eight, maybe a Bortle nine. Most of the suburbs are about a Bortle seven. At Bortle seven, we've lost 90% of the stars. If you go out in, in the boundary waters and watch all of the stars that go by for a year, you'll count about 5,000 stars. You come down into the suburbs where I live, you're going to count 10% of that, about 500 stars. And in the core city, it's even fewer than that. So you, you think about, uh, again, uh, the, the stars as part of our ecosystem. What if we had lost 90% of our lakes in Minnesota? What if we were the land of 1,000 lakes? Doesn't sound very good. I looked it up. The land of 1,000 lakes? Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. Oh, and of course, there's, there's the beauty of, of the night sky. I mentioned I have to drive 100 miles to go see a, a dark sky. This is, this is what you can see when the aurora is out if you drive 100 miles away. Uh, this one, I actually had to go down to Chile to get that. That's the, the Milky Way, so this was a, a Portal 1 site. Uh, not going to see that here. And it's not because it isn't here. Think about that. If you go out to, tonight, those stars, the Milky Way, they're all here. They're shining above us. It's just, you know, they, they've come billions of light years to get to Earth. And it's that last 60 miles where we wash it all out and, and ruin the whole thing. Next slide. And of course, uh, moving on to the next reason why we should care about light pollution, wasted energy and, and climate change. So 35% of the electricity that we spend on our lighting 
go straight up into the sky to light up the International Space Station and Mars and, and Pluto. Totally wasted. Instead, if we could take that light and point it back down at the Earth, we could have 35% less energy and still have exactly the same amount of light down here on the surface of the Earth where we all care about it. That's $3 billion a year. That's $10 a person for every man, woman, and child living in the United States. And of course, that has a carbon footprint. Uh, current estimate based on where electricity comes from in this country, 21 million tons of carbon dioxide every year that we're just using to, to light up the sky. Uh, that would be the equivalent of 3 million passenger cars, and we'd have to plant 600 million trees to make up for all that CO2 that, that we're needlessly generating. Cultural loss. This is, this is something, uh, so I mentioned earlier that uh, astronomy really uh, was at the dawn of civilization. And every culture around the world has its own star lore, its own cultural stories about uh, the night sky. And they're not just stories. I mean, we can all go out and, you know, I can show you Orion, we, we can find the Big Dipper, and we can show you Perseus and Andromeda. And, and those, those are wonderful names and they're wonderful constellations to look at. But, but for ancient cultures, they weren't just stories. That was where the lessons were put that were passed down from generation to generation. So it was the lessons for right living, right and wrong within that, that culture, the, the good examples and the horrible reminders. And they, they provided the clues for when to do things in, in the year. So we've all heard about you know, the flooding of the Nile, and, and so the Egyptians would wait to look for when Sirius was rising about the same time the sun was. It was called the helical rising of Sirius. And they knew that that meant that the Nile was about to flood. That was the, the time to go out and plant. I was on a conference yesterday and had a wonderful speaker, uh, a member of the, the DNA people, or, or Navajo as, as they're sometimes called. They used the Pleiades, the seven sisters, to know when it was time for them to plant. During a, there's a few week period where you can't see the Pleiades from the, the homelands down in the Four Corners area, and they knew that that was the time to plant. So around the world, cultures used it not just to know, uh, <coughs> not just to pass down the, the lessons of right living, but also how to survive. So very important to us. I, I love this. This is up here in the Boundary Waters. I don't know if you can see that very well. Uh, there's three constellations here. This is moose, where we get our word moose from. Uh, we call that Pegasus, except theirs is right side up. Our Pegasus rises upside down. Uh, something called Curly Tail. And then my favorite constellation, that guy over there called Wintermaker. And he's like, if you've ever seen Orion in the night sky, this is Orion on steroids, because he's got these huge arms that stick out far farther than, than Orion does. And that is exactly what the name implies. When they saw Wintermaker rising, they knew it's gonna be winter, we better do something about it. And then, then you think about what we might have lost from, uh, from our art. So on, on the left, of course, is, is Van Gogh's Starry Night. Uh, this is somebody's speculative idea of what Van Gogh would have had to have uh, painted today if he had tried to paint Starry Night. Next slide. Okay, next reason why we should care about light pollution in environmental justice, and, and two slides here on, on this. So this is, this is exposure to light pollution. So I, I hope I was able successfully to convey earlier, light pollution has some real negative impacts on, on human health and wellness. All right, who's getting that the worst, of, who's getting the brunt of that? And it turns out all things are, are not created equal. Uh, I don't know if you can see this very well back here. This is a, a graph, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but it shows for three, oh yeah, thanks Alex. Um, <laughs> for three different uh, population groups, so this, this orange one here, that is, is uh, people who identify as white, and this, this is the time of day that they go to work uh, relative to an average. So you can see that uh, whites generally uh, go to work uh, pretty evenly throughout the, the day, so when, when, when their shift starts. Blacks uh, tend to primarily have jobs that, that have them working second shift. 
And similarly, with Latinos, they tend to be working more in those wee hours of the night. So, so uh, Latinos and blacks are exposed to more of artificial light at night because they're getting up, they're driving down these streets with the street lights, they're going into a, a lit building uh, and being exposed to more of that artificial light. And, and so that's the exposure, <coughs> excuse me, that, that's the hours that they work, and then this is the exposure that they end up getting because of that. So what we see is they're really being exposed. Here, here's the, the, the white people down here have an average of, uh, doesn't matter about the units, but 2,000, and then Asian, Hispanics, and, and blacks have about twice that nighttime exposure. So we, we see that different subgroups within our population have different exposure to artificial light at night, and, and that, as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, has an impact. Next slide. Okay, so what does that, that mean then for, for the impact for, for them? Uh, as we saw earlier, about 10 slides back, uh, that is not slide 23, I can't remember. Uh, folks that have what we call a low social economic score, so a, an SEI. SEI is a number that's made up of things like income, education level, housing, uh, basically opportunities to advance themselves in society. Those folks that score, have low scores uh, on that scale are exposed to more artificial light at night. We've seen that that in turn is, is going to result in more health impacts for them. They're going to be uh, more challenged medically and, and from a wellness standpoint. And, and then, uh, of course, that may be the case because they're, they're working second shifts. They, they may be working part-time jobs. They may have lower income jobs. They're more likely to have less access to good uh, medical care, whether that's mental health or, or physical health. So th this is part one of, one of the punch. So they've got more exposure, more risk, less opportunity to mitigate that, that risk through access to good health care. And then uh, the one-two punch part of this is that they're also less likely to be able to go out and experience the natural environment. Uh, I heard a, a great factoid this morning. 23% of Minnesotans are members of a community of, of color, but only 5% of visitors to Minnesota state parks are people from that same community. So that's a factor of four or five to one less likely to be able to have access to those, those natural spaces where they could get renewed and go out and, and have that sense of awe and wonder and, and beauty. So uh, kind of a one-two punch there. Next slide. Okay, so that, that's kind of a lot of bad news. Uh, let, let's talk about uh, what we can do, and it turns out that there's actually some, some good news in, in that area. Next slide. Okay. Uh, the IEA has worked with one of the uh, industrial uh, societies out there, the Illuminating Engineering Society, to develop what we call the five pillars for responsible outdoor lighting. The first one is just that it's useful. Is that light on for a reason? Is it doing something for you? Is it keeping you safer? Is it helping you move through, through the nighttime environment? Uh, if it's not, then why is it on? Uh, targeted. Put that shield on there. Rather than lighting up the nighttime sky, put that shield on, put that light where you actually want it, where it's actually going to do some good and prevent a little bit of glare while, while you're at it. Low light level. As I mentioned earlier, light is a tool. And like any other tool, you want to pick the right tool for the job. You're trying to break down a wall, sledgehammer is a great choice. You're trying to hang a picture, Sledgehammers, maybe not the right choice. So think about having the, the right amount of light and no more. Uh, otherwise, you're just wasting money, wasting light. Uh, controlled is, is a great thing. So having it on that motion detector, a lot of us are you know, maybe wanting to have that light that comes on in the garage or outside the garage as we're coming and going in the nighttime environment. Have that light come on automatically for you, but then when you're inside the house, have that light go off when it's not doing you any good anymore. And then finally, color. We talked about color temperature, picking those warmer colors and, and avoiding those, those high blue lights. The other bit of good news is 
unlike some of the other light, uh, the other forms of pollution that, that we're dealing with. So we've heard about, you know, the forever chemicals or the Superfund sites where we've got uh, water and land and, and soil pollutions that are going to be really hard to solve or the, the CO2 levels, uh, you know, it's going to take decades if not centuries to get those CO2 levels back down. Light pollution doesn't linger in the environment. You turn off that light, it's done. Now, you, you've got uh, some mitigation that you have to do, so you know, we, we've got to let those ecosystems recover, uh, but it doesn't linger in the environment. Next slide. So we talked about shielding. Yeah, there's just a graphic that, that shows that. Next slide. Here's a great example of what, what a difference good quality lighting can make. Same building, unshielded blue lights, shielded amber lights. So you notice all of a sudden, you know, with this one, all you could see was the bright lights. I, human eyes are amazing. They can see uh, from brightest to darkest, they can see a hundred million times factor from brightest to darkest, but they can only do one at a time. And so if you're gonna look at this bright light, your eye is going to shut down and it's gonna see that brightest light and you're going to lose everything that's going on here, including these, these doors. Same, same building, now you can start to see the, these doors, uh, which, which can help improve safety. So, you know, the question is, which would you rather look at? Uh, this one's gonna run you about a, a third the electricity of, of the other one. And I would argue that that's a, a better looking view anyway. Next slide. Okay, urban night sky place program. So we've talked about the international dark sky places. Those are great if you can get yourself up to the Boundary Waters, if you can get yourself up to Quetico. But what about the rest of us that are living right here in the metro area or folks that can't get out up to the Boundary Waters, can't go canoeing? The, international, the, the IDA has launched what they call the Urban Night Sky Place Program, which is just a place within 50 kilometers, 30 miles of a brightly lit area where people are welcome to come in at night regardless of light pollution and enjoy the night sky for what it is. Even here in the metro area, you can still see the moon, you can still see the planets. There's, there's still some, some beauty to be had in the night sky. So uh, we're very excited. Uh, two miles from the end of the runway at the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport sits Wood Lake Nature Center and they are working to become Minnesota's first urban night sky place. And really the only requirement is it can be uh, public land, it can be private land, they just have to let people come in for at least some portion of, of the night and be there and experience a, a, a night sky. So brilliant, I, I think that's just wonderful because this is where we all live, right? Next slide. Okay. Uh, so what, what can you do? So apply the five principles. Uh, think about when you're going to the, the hardware store, looking on the back of that package of light bulbs, looking for that, that warm color, uh, and then doing a, a lighting audit. Do I have lights on that I really don't need to have on? And then of course, talk to your, your community, talk to your friends and family about what we've just talked about here. And then certainly reach out uh, to your decision makers, your uh, council members, what have you. Let them know that this is something that, that you care about and uh, you, you think there are, are some good low cost and no cost solutions that they can be making at that municipal level. Next one. <laughs> Ta-da, made it. <laughs> well, thank you everyone. You have to have questions. <laughs> Jerry? Uh, one question about daylight savings time. I know the light doesn't change, but is there an organization of a preference for a solution for that? Or? Yeah, the, the, the folks that, that do have a strong opinion about it are, are what we call chronobiologists. So the biologists that study behavior, uh, biological systems over time. So what happens to the human body over day and night. They see a, a strong advantage. They, they don't care too much about whether we go on or go off, but if, I mean, if, if we get rid of daylight savings, but if we get rid of it, they very much want us to go on standard time because that's what aligns our clock schedule when we get up to go to work with 
the rising and the setting of, of the sun. So if, if we're going to, as a, as a nation, pick one or the other, standard time or daylight time, very much the, 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 the scientists tell us standard time is much better than daylight time. Yeah? Sorry, I forgot to use this earlier. Todd, thanks. Um, I had a chance to, uh, two things. I had a chance to meet you some time ago, obviously. And I'm just so impressed with your presentation. I think we all are. I'm, I you. appreciate your passion and your focus and all. I know you're retired, and I'm just so impressed because this is, you're giving yourself to the world in retirement about something you have a great passion for and something that's very important. So I just thank you for that. Then okay. the second question I have, if you could say just a little bit, and I mentioned just prior to this, but I think you talked some this last weekend with some of your colleagues. Again, good news. Tell us a little about, about New Zealand. Yeah, so, so New Zealand, so, so I, I've mentioned the international dark sky places. New Zealand is, is very excited. They're working very hard not to just have national parks within New Zealand be dark sky places. They are working towards becoming the world's first international dark sky country. The entire country of New Zealand is working towards having standards that are going to protect the natural night sky all across the, the entire country. So uh, talk about an aspiration we can all uh, strive for. Yeah. Uh, I have a good news, bad news story. You, you know them both. But one is uh, we have a cabin in uh, Upper Michigan. And there's a dark sky park there on Wagashans yes. Point, which is way to the uh, southern part of the, the, the mid of Michigan, the lower part of Michigan, way at the top. And it, it's a place that looks out over Lake Michigan, which is dark. Yeah. So that's good news. The bad news is where our cabin is, we look out over it, over the Straits of Mackinac, an island and another island. Beyond that, ringed with cell towers now. Oh. And the town of, of uh, Mackinac, uh, Sheboygan, Michigan has grown behind it. And we've watched that slowly, that light pollution creep up. When our son got married uh, 40 years ago, we, we had, uh, unbelievable starlight, and today it's a quarter of that. It, yeah, yeah, it, and it's, it's such a challenge. You know, and, and once you start talking to people about light pollution, like we have here, you know, it's, it's really hard to find people that think battling light pollution is a bad idea. You know, it, some, sometimes we can talk about safety issues, and you know, that, that's a whole other lecture that, that we can have. But at the end of the day, there's just not a lot of good reasons to pollute the, the sky like we have, other than that's just the way we've always done it and no one really thought too much about it, so, yeah. I'm, um, I'm going to end our session um, officially. You can certainly stay and talk with Todd afterwards and it stay as a group. Um, but first, I just want to thank you so much for coming. And also, I want to let you know about next Sunday, um, Katie Lynn Br Bunny Booney is coming. She's the education coordinator for the Monarch Joint Venture, and she'll talk about monarch butterfly conservation and you know just simple ways we can all make a difference in in that. So, um, um, thank you so much for coming and um, stay in. Ask questions more if you'd like. I'll, I'll be here as long as there are questions. Thank you, everyone. So, um, you want to hold this mic? So, everyone can hear your questions. I said a quick question about um, like street lights, you know?